Hello, welcome everybody. Good to see you all. Hello, hello. You can wave a hand. Everybody is, hi Anna, how are you? Good to see you. People are on mute, but you can certainly hi, wave Anna. a hand. Nice to see everyone. We'll hang out for a few minutes as we wait for more people to come on. And we will be asking people to uh, introduce themselves in the chat, your name, your role, your geographic location, if anybody wants to get started and do that. Good to see familiar names. Don't know how big today will be, we'll see. A lot of people signed up, but I know then people get busy and everything <clears throat> starts to fall apart. Diane Landon, I'm trying to see what those uh, photos are on the wall behind you. It looks like, uh, <clears throat> tell us, tell, you want to unmute yourself and tell us what those are? You're on mute, Diane. Yeah, just, just unmute for a sec. Still, uh, you're still, you're still muted. Just hit, hit the unmute. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm sorry, I was I was on another meeting trying to multitask. Oh, um, oh yeah, well. Yeah, but uh, these are just our um, expectation um, for our school. Oh. That's up there. Okay. So we have those hanging in all of our rooms. In our rooms, be responsible, be productive, and be respectful. Oh, that's great! You can have a virtual background with that as well. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Welcome people coming on the call now. People are just introducing themselves Fabulous. in the chat, their name, the role, geographic location. Thanks everybody for taking time to come today. Um, if you can turn on your camera, if that's available to you, it's uh, much nicer for Kim and for me to speak to real people and not frozen screens, but I understand if that's not possible. So we've got people from Minneapolis, where else? We've got Oregon, other people want to introduce themselves, West Fargo, North Dakota, fantastic. And I see Ken Schulak, hello Ken, great to see you, and Barbara Ball, my goodness. Some familiar yeah, names. Great. Yeah, so, so Ken, are you, you're, not, you're not on a yacht, you're not on a cruise ship, <laughs> you're just uh, hunkered down in New Jersey. Uh, the whole world's hunkered down at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you. And Barbara, you're looking well. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah, well, I hope we do not disappoint you. <laughs> the pressure is on here. We got, the, we got the first string here. We got Michigan in the house, New Hampshire, fantastic. Faye Roop, that's a very familiar name. Faye, give me a memory prompt here. Un unmute. Uh, mathematics coach at Maimonides. Ah, of course, of course, right down the street. Right but down the street. You're probably not right down the street right now, right? <laughs> right. I'm at home in Chestnut Hill. Oh, good, good. Yeah, well, that's that's actually not too far away. Right. Uh, Y'all are neighbors. Yeah. Now, Maimonides is this amazing school right on Route Nine, right, right close. I mean, was within half a mile of where, where I am right now. It's a, just, and they have been faithful Marshall Memo subscribers for many years. A big group. I hope it's been helpful. Incredibly helpful. Good, good, great. Oh, I see Lisa Daly. Hey, Lisa, how are you? She's in one of my mastermind groups. Always shows up for these things. And, and Kathy Nino, you have the most uh, uh, arresting photo there for yourself. That is, uh, <laughs> that is wonderful. Great, thanks everybody. We're just introducing ourselves in the chat, your name, your role, where you're from. So we get a sense of where people are from. Shannon from, I'm sorry, Shannon from uh, Southern California, Tony, all the, oh, Atlanta, Georgia, Katrina. Fantastic. Thanks, everyone. And as much as many of you can uh, turn on your camera. It's great to be able to see who Kim and I are talking to. If that's available to you, that's great. Welcome, everybody. We'll get started in just a moment. Um, we're going to put a poll up just so everyone can see who is here. So maybe we'll give it a start. Kim, should we start the poll now? Sure. That's great. Yeah. All right. It's just to ask um, who you are. Welcome. Who is here? 
So if you let us know. Welcome Dave from Buffalo Public School. Leanne Sanderson from Marshall County, coming to see Kim Marshall speak, excellent. April Clayton from Mississippi, welcome, welcome. Thank you everyone for taking time, either at the end of the day or your lunch break for you uh, West Coasters. I will share the results of the poll. You can see who else is here today. So it looks like the poll is live updating as people as well, for you and for me, we haven't shared it yet. Oh, I see. Okay, okay. We Great. can I see it, but they will see it shortly. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Oh, Maria Fisher from Staten Island. Hi, neighbor. I'm in Brooklyn. The COVID rates have been getting high in Staten Island, unfortunately. And uh, just before this call, they announced in New York City that they're temporarily shutting the schools. I got the email from the chancellor at uh, 224 and the text from Rachel from the UFT. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right before this, so. The whole island's been declared yellow. Yeah, but all of New York City. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My daughter's in New York City Public School. She's not going in tomorrow. Where in Brooklyn are you? I am in the South, South Slope Gowanus region. Oh, okay. I grew up in Sunset Park. Oh, neighbor. And yep. Nice yep. to meet you, Maria. Nice to meet you too. Hi, Mr. Marshall. Hello. Good to see you. How are you? Good. Call me Kim. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's right. I haven't heard anybody call you Mr. Marshall. <laughs> I went to Catholic school. <laughs> the, the, the teachers in the Boston school where I was principal for 15 years <clears throat> still to this day cannot call me Kim. It's still <laughs> I don't think I can either. Very, very old fashioned uh, so British boarding school kind of uh, kind of feel to it. <laughs> Makes sense. So hi, if you're just coming on, we're going to start in a moment. Um, share your name and your role in your geographic location in the chat to introduce yourself. And we have a little poll going if you wanna tell us who you are so we can see who's here. Um, I assume the poll is available even for people coming on right now. If you can turn on your video, Kim and I would appreciate it. It's really hard to talk to a whole bunch of names, much better to speak to faces. If, you, if that's available, we would appreciate that. And, um, I am just going to end the poll in just a few seconds so that we can get started. It's good to start on time. So who do we have here today? We've got majority principals, heads of school, system principals. We've got the fewest teacher leaders, just one, or right now just one, and uh, some superintendents, a number of teachers. Fantastic. This chapter is perfect for teachers, teacher leaders, all. Great. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today. We want to start promptly. So um, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview of what's going to happen today. Uh, just so you know, we're recording. So uh, don't do anything that uh, you wouldn't want recorded. Um, we're going to have sort of six sections to what's happening today in this short hour. We're going to do a lot. Uh, first, we're going to introduce ourselves and the book. And then we're going to give um, you an opportunity in breakout rooms to share your insights on what makes learning stick. Then we're going to give you an overview of all of the articles in the chapter and give you an opportunity to read an article live. If you have the PDF with you, that's great. If not, I will put a link in the chat. Hi, Shahara. Um, but if you have your link that we sent earlier, or if you have your book, itself even better. Um, then we're going to get together in the, a big group and share our takeaways. And finally, we're going to give you ideas for how to use the ideas in the chapter with your schools or your districts um, at the very end. So we've got a lot going on today. And without further ado, we are going to start with uh, Kim. Let Kim introduce himself. Greetings. I'm Kim Marshall. Uh, so just to give the backstory of this before we dive into the into this chapter itself. Uh, so I was in the Boston schools for 32 years uh, as a teacher, then a central office curriculum director, and then as a principal. And during that time, I never had enough time to read. Uh, I tried to read, I uh, fitted it in on weekends sometimes, had a pile of stuff I should should have been reading, but uh, but didn't do too well on it. But I had a lot of experience. And when I stopped being a principal in 2002, 
uh, I started reading like crazy and I had the idea of the Marshall Memo. And I think most of you are here because you either get the Marshall Memo or have heard about it. So it's a weekly publication where I summarize the best ideas from the 60 publications plus that I subscribe to. And I do it each week, it goes out every Tuesday and it's all over the world, 74 countries, all 50 states, a lot of people read the memo. And, uh, and that's great, okay, so it's a, it's a burst of professional development each week for those of you who receive it, teachers, principals, superintendents, consultants, uh, teacher leaders, et cetera. Uh, the problem with the Marshall Memo though is that it's, it's a little bit random. It's the stuff that happened to hit my mailbox that week uh, and then I'm choosing the best of that. Uh, so, so then I had the idea of, a, of, a, of an archive in the cloud. So late Monday night before I send it, I upload everything to the cloud and it's all searchable. So you can go and search and then, so that's good, but who has time to search? And, and so then I said, okay, well, I'm gonna identify the classics, the very best of the best articles. And, and those are highlighted in red in the archive. So that's helpful. But again, who has time to do that? So then I got together with Jen David Lang, who'll introduce herself in a moment. Uh, we've been friends for years and years. She does a parallel publication. And we decided let's have a book that has the best of the Marshall Memo summaries from all 16, 17 years that I've been doing it. And uh, so, so we said, great, okay, so this will be easy. Uh, we'll just go into the archive and we'll pick the classics and we'll have a book. So we did that and it actually turned out to be a lot harder than we thought. <laughs> it's not just the classics. So it turned out to be a pretty complicated uh, business of picking the best articles. And then we realized we had 22 topics, way too many for one book. So now there are two books. There's, okay, there's the best of Marshall Mo book one, and then there's the best of Marshall book, book two. Okay, so, uh, so 22 chapters in all. And then each chapter really was a, a challenge. And this is where Jen's brain came in so handy, it was so important, was, was is, first of all, picking the right articles. And then it turns out there are groups, there are subgroups within each chapter, and then sequencing them and then Jen adding this incredibly valuable professional development suggestions at the end. So we've, we're, zero, we're zooming in on one chapter today on Zoom. And, and this chapter is on the whole business of memory and how people remember stuff. And the chapter, as we sorted the articles and thought about them and threw articles out and put new articles in and everything, uh, it really falls into sort of four logical groups. Uh, the first one is the brain science. Because a lot of good brain science in the last 10 years about you know, how the brain works and how we store memories and what we forget. Uh, the second group is the retrieval effect, uh, something I had never heard of before, before I started reading for the Marshall Memo, which is the, the whole power of short tests, short retrieval to embed stuff more deeply in the mind, to wrap the mile in, okay? Uh, the third section is, is study skills, uh, all important things for kids of how you get them to learn study skills, especially when they go to college or the military or anywhere else. And the final thing is the question of now that we got Google, you know, like, uh, do we have to memorize anything? You know, do we have to do we have to actually remember stuff? So those are the sections of, of the book of the chapter that we're going to dive into today. And we'll dive even deeper as we can. So Jen asked me uh, to, and she's the big organizer of this of this webinar. Is, is is what's my favorite article idea in this chapter? And I have to say. It's from an article by Kathy Gansky about how her, when she was a kid, how her father used to ask her every night, what did you learn in school today? And at first, of course, you know, she couldn't think of anything. And he, he was persistent. He kept asking her. And so she began during the day to make a point of, of sort of bookmarking certain things and so that she could tell her dad. And then when she became a teacher, she started doing that with her kids in a quite a systematic way. So I love that idea, just the prompt of what did you learn in school today? And you know what they, you know, the answer frequently is, is well, nothing. So, okay, so Jen, take it away. Sure, great. Well, thanks, Kim. Um, many of you know me, some of you don't. Um, I'm Jen David Lang. I've also been in the field uh, of education, not as long as Kim, but more than 25 years. And uh, more recently, in the last, last decade or so, I have been supporting school leaders, mostly through the main idea, which is my publication. Every month I send school leaders across the country a summary of a great education book. And at the end I have PD ideas so you can introduce the ideas of the book to your staff members. And then more recently I started running masterminds, which are groups of school leaders from across the country. We meet every other week online for professional learning, for problem solving, for sharing. We've got two mastermind members here today. If you want to learn more, you can look at my uh, website. 
And um, it's been an absolute pleasure to collaborate with Kim. Any of you who have ever worked with him, you know he's a sharp thinker and he's a really thoughtful educator. So doing this book together was um, fantastic. Really books, these books together. Um, so I just wanted to share for me, one article that really stood out was the um, ninth article. It's called, How Can We Help Students Remember More? Very simply by Daniel Willingham. And actually I think I saw him on this call Daniel Willingham, are you here by any chance? Uh, yeah, I am actually. Oh, thank you so much. So glad that you're joining. I didn't know you were here and uh, I picked your article. Hi, <laughs> great to see the face behind the man. Um, so I read for a living and um, I'll be reading and then the phone rings and I get it. And then I come back to my reading and I've totally forgotten what I read. And Daniel Willingham helped me realize why that is. And it's because I didn't do any thinking about what I had just read, about what I had just learned. He says that, listen to this, this is a great line. Memory is the residue of thought, meaning that the more you think about something, the more likely you'll remember it. So we really need to get kids to think about what they're learning, not just teach, not just put stuff in, but we need them to think about it. And he gave a really simple suggestion that all of you can have your teachers do tomorrow, which is, at the end of every paragraph, just have students stop, pause, and ask the question, why? Whether they're reading about science, history, or even a novel, very simple, no planning in advance. So I love that. Anyway, I love a lot of this chapter because a lot of the suggestions are actionable. They're things that you can do tomorrow. So um, to begin, um, Basically, each of the chapters are an answer to a problem that we have in schools, right? To a common problem. So one of the common problems is that students often don't remember what we teach. Could you all raise your hand if you have ever had the experience of teaching something and then months later, weeks later, even days later, students don't remember? I think most of us have, it's a pretty common problem. So what we're gonna do is um, ask you to go out into the breakout rooms and Alegria is gonna post two questions. We're gonna start with your experiences and we're not gonna have you grumble about all those times students didn't remember, but rather the opposite. We're gonna ask you to discuss um, what have been some of your best ideas for helping students to remember what was taught? What memory tricks have you used as an educator or for yourself personally to help remember. And the more specific you are, the more pe other people in your group are going to walk away with ideas. So I'm going to put you into groups. And what I'd like to have happen is the person with the longest hair go first so that we don't have, we can get right into the discussion. And um, very briefly, 10 seconds, introduce yourself and your role, and then answer this question, these questions that are in the chat. And we're going to give everybody about two minutes to do this. I am going to put everyone into breakout groups. Uh, now. Well, wait a minute. Okay. Great. When you get the link, you can jump into a breakout room. See you in a few. Hello, all. Welcome back. Amy Smith Clark, nice uh, fall virtual background. I love it before we hit winter. So I hope it was a good opportunity to be able to speak to other educators from all over. I thought we weren't international, but we are. We've got some people from Ecuador and then all across the US. I guess it depends on your time zone, whether you could, uh, you could make the meeting. Welcome back everybody. I hope it was good to chat for a few minutes with an educator somewhere across the country or elsewhere. We are gonna get deeper into the chapter in just a moment while everybody is coming back. Welcome back everyone. And once we get Kim back, he's gonna share a little bit of an overview. Kim's not coming back. No, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, I hope it was useful for everyone to chat uh, a little bit to prime your brains about the topic of what makes learning stick. And uh, Kim is going to give you an overview of the chapters. And I'll, I'll put up the second. You want to put up the poll now, Kim, so you can see them? Sure, sure go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Here, so, don't do the poll yet. Yeah, ho hold on. So we got everyone back who's, who's coming back. Great. Okay. So, uh, 
what we want to do, and this is a sort of zoom in, zoom out, zoom in kind of kind of thing here. So we've activated what you already know, and you already know a lot. <laughs> in fact, a lot of what's in this chapter, but there's more. And so what I'm going to do is to read the quick summary of each of these articles, and you're going to decide on one, just one, that you're going to actually read live. Now, you may have read the whole chapter, or maybe you haven't, but we want you to actually take a few minutes, like four or five minutes, to actually read. But, but before you do, I want to just give you the quick overview, which is in the beginning of this chapter. So <clears throat> uh, the article number one <clears throat> describes the hard cognitive work students must do to build and maintain neural new networks that hold important information in their brains. Article number two explains the limits of working memory and suggests how teachers can apply their understanding to improve students' retention and reduce classroom stress. Article number three, and by the way, is the poll up now, uh, Jen? I'm not seeing the poll. I want to throw it up there. Uh, so article number three, don't vote yet, hear, hear me out here, <clears throat> is the, it says that embedding important knowledge and skills in students' long-term memory requires skillful, but not necessarily jazzy teaching and hard work by students. Article number four describes the power of frequent low stakes tests to greatly improve retention. Number five explains why taking a final exam before instruction improves understanding and memory. That's a pretty crazy idea, like give the, give the final exam up front. Article number six, <clears throat> uh, that's the Kathy Gansky article I mentioned earlier, remembers how she got her second graders to remember what they learned each day and a week and share it with their families. Number seven says research has shown that college students taking notes by hand have significantly better retention and grades than those typing notes on a laptop. Number eight, <clears throat> reports on that studying in, is most effective when students work with challenging material, study mixed content, and use more than one location space studying over time and space it over time and test themselves frequently. Number nine by Daniel Willingham, who's here, shares research on how students can commit facts and skills to memory and how they can avoid forgetting and how they can avoid the trap of overconfidence. One of the really interesting things with memory, we think we've got it, but we don't. Now, the 10th category is actually three articles, but we only have 10 options in Zoom. So uh, the, the number, but you can choose one of these because you, the, you have the book, you have the, the chapter. Uh, 10 is also by Daniel Willingham, lists four ways that our brains outperform Google and suggests the kind of information that is best committed to memory. Number 11 shares the common course recommendations on memorizing times tables and other math facts. And the last article argues that having students memorize poetry and recite poetry which was a staple in the U.S. schools until the 1920s has real value in today's classrooms. Okay, so go ahead in the poll and vote for one of those uh, that you would most like to read. Now you can read all of them, of course, because you've got the chapter, we gave it to you for free, but choose one and then we're going to actually pause and have you read it live. I hope you don't hear this leaf blower outside my window here. They decided that this is the time when they're going to, can you hear that, Jen? <laughs> this is the time. Hey, you can just mute. No, yeah, no, you can just mute yourself. Uh, okay. Jim, why don't you mute yourself? Yeah, so, so there you uh, go. Choose, choose your chapter right. and, uh, and go ahead and then start to read it. Uh, and we're going to give you about five minutes. Is that correct, Jen? Five minutes to read the chapter. Hold on. Let's just give them a second to finish the poll. I'm going to share the poll. And then if you're influenced by other people, you can see. So just right. take about 10 more seconds, pick a chapter, and don't worry, it's anonymous. You can say you're interested in one chapter and read another. Um, <laughs> We'll take a look and see what people are interested in. We've got almost everybody. All right, and five, four, three, two, one. All right, so let's see. Oh, good, this makes Daniel Willingham feel good. Most people want it, he got the most answers. Yay, number nine. You can read anyone you want to read. Um, this was just a sort of prime you to think about what you might want to read. Um, I am going to put a link in the chat if you did not bring your PDF. And what we're going to ask you to do is just mute yourselves and literally read right here. And it's a great strategy for a staff meeting. We all ask teachers or administrators to read for a meeting and they don't. So um, just take five minutes, which is what we're doing, out of your staff meeting and have them read an article live and then you know everyone has read it. So um, I'm going to give everybody five minutes to read the, 
the article of their choice. If yours is short, go ahead and pick another one. And then afterwards, we're going to discuss two questions that Alegria is going to put in the chat for you, just so you are prepared. But basically, what's something you learned from the article? And if you can be as specific as possible, because we're going to do a jigsaw, we're going to be in breakout groups with people who have read other articles. If you can share more specifically so that people feel like they've read the article that you read. So what did you read that was new? And then two, what are some implications for teaching and learning? So I will mute myself and let's all read. Okay, if you could just finish up your sentence wherever you are. Um, to do this in a staff meeting, you have to be comfortable with silence. Or sometimes I've played music, some people find that a little annoying, but they can always mute you. So, um, but this is a good exercise. Good to see familiar names, Kevin Boston Hill, hello. Um, someone just said, sorry, I'm driving. So uh, I guess we should have said in advance. I think we said it's not a webinar. We're not going to talk at you. We thought we'd give an opportunity for people to interact with the articles and the materials. So, uh, so it's not us up here with the uh, slideshow presentation. So we're going to go back into breakout groups for a second time. I've recreated the groups so that you're meeting with new people. And this time we'll have the person with the shortest hair go first. But maybe the person with the longest hair be prepared to share out at the end and basically again very briefly 10 seconds introduce yourself and your role and then see if you can encapsulate the article in a few sentences or what you got out of it so the other person feels like they're learning something from your article that's a jigsaw as you all know and then the second part are what are the implications for teaching and learning you know what can your teachers do tomorrow or if you're a teacher what can you do tomorrow with what you learned so we're going to take about 10 minutes in these breakout groups so we have time for some discussion and we will see you back here in about 10 minutes. Welcome back, everybody. I hope it uh, worked out that people in the rooms read different articles. It looked like we had a, a jigsaw only works if people read different articles. So welcome back. Hope everybody had a chance to, uh, to speak. Did everyone choose a good article? Hope people are walking away with uh, implications, ideas. Fantastic. Well, um, we're posting a question to the chat that we're gonna ask people to share in the chat. And uh, Kim, you're back to. Let's see, unmute, mute, unmute. Can you hear me? <laughs> there you go, yeah. We're and I think the leaf people are, are finished. I think they've, <laughs> they've finished. Could you hear that in the background? So while people are coming back, let me just mention one thing um, before we get into the all group sharing and, and do think about those of you all with the long hair, think about you know, the article that you particularly want to draw attention to for, for all of us. But I wanna say that in the Marshall Memo archive, uh, there is a section called all faculty discussion articles. And I've identified 55 articles from all the years of the Marshall Memo that I think lend themselves to being done what we just did with, with, with an article, which is everybody reading it together and then discussing in first in small groups and then as a whole faculty. Uh, and there's certain articles that lend themselves to that. So you can, if you go to the archive, just email me if you, if you want a reminder on your password. And at the top of the topics list is all faculty articles. Check that box, hit search, and they'll all pop up and then you can. Okay, so what we're going to do now, first in the chat, and then we will ask people to raise their hands electronically. You know, you go to the participants, you click on participants, you can raise your hand, and that should bump you to the top of the list. And then we would like to hear some brave souls uh, share out to all 100 of us, uh, what are things that particularly are sticking with you and things that you really want to bring back to your, to your colleagues, uh, especially in this crazy time when remembering stuff is just so important. So. Go ahead and, and, and enter in the chat, and we're going to save this to the chat, of course. And then, uh, and then when you've done that, uh, go ahead and and, um, and and electronically raise your hand, but not this kind of hand raise, but electronically go to participants, hit raise hand, and uh, we will. We have a few minutes here. Yeah, we got actually more than a few minutes. Uh, we have. Let's see, Jen, you want about okay? So we want about about you know five or six minutes to to or no ten minutes. Excuse me to hear. Uh, hear your voices and hear what you particularly are taking away from what you read or what a colleague in your breakout room uh, read uh, that really resonates with you that's powerful and that you can actually uh, want to put to work and, and, and give to your colleagues. 
So right right away in your in the chat um, on those key ideas, and then uh, and then raise your hand, and we would love an Alleg Allegria and uh, if you want to uh, identify people who are raising their hand and who are uh, ready to share out, and you'll unmute yourself, and we'd love to hear a sort of one one or one and a half minute summary of that key idea that's really jumped out at you. We can raise your hand now. You want to unmute, Julie? I'm gonna take a few seconds first, let a few more people share in the chat before we take live. Sorry, you let me know. Hello, Lisa, by the way, and hello, Vaughn. Uh, great to see both of you. And Rhoda, hi to Rhoda, oh, special yeah. guest. Right. So yeah, some good, good points in the chat here. Relationships matter, right? Be careful about working memory, particularly now, right? A lot of stress going on during COVID. Testing is the key to studying, right? Failing the pretest actually leads to more learning. There's some great comments. Everyone take a look at the chat, what other people wrote. We don't so ask we, students. Go ahead, you wanna take them, Kim? Uh, well, no, just, just so interesting that testing has got such a bad reputation these days. There's so much anti-testing sentiment. In fact, I live in Massachusetts, which is the world capital of anti-testing uh, thinkers. And, uh, and just this idea that, that an informal test can be so productive in terms of retaining memory is, is a really a new idea for me. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think it's just a powerful stuff. Uh, Pooja Agarwal is uh, here in Boston at, at Berkeley College uh, is one of the one of the great thinkers on this, along with uh, with her colleagues at the University of Washington in St. Louis. Uh, they've done some wonderful work on that. Okay, so anyone want to share out verbally as well as in the chat? Uh, and, and, you know, it's just powerful ideas that are jumping out at you that you want to reinforce for everybody else on the call. Am I mistaken that I was supposed to go first? Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. agree just to pick someone. Okay, great. Um, hi, I'm Julie, and um, in my group, it's interesting because I am a note taker, I'm na just naturally a note taker, and um, my fellow group member, uh, Reginald, was uh, summarizing the note taking versus writing, taking notes on a laptop article, and so um, that stuck with me because I was note taking uh, his, his uh, summary. Um, so the big question is, which is better for students? And um, the research talks about that there's encoding involved when you're when you're writing things by hand. So it's involving a mental process while you're um, handwriting, as opposed to writing on a laptop. Um, we're trained to type nowadays so quickly that it's almost like an automatic. We're transcribing rather than processing what we're hearing. So in terms of us walking away, if we want a transcription of the, um, of the lecture or whatever we're listening to, yes, typing may get more information down, but because when we're note taking, we have to summarize because we can't get everything down, it's actually more effective when, um, when you talk about recalling what we're listening to. Um, and the last thing that I will say is uh, with laptops also, there's that temptation, right? You're online, so you might get down a rabbit hole of clicking on something that's not quite relevant. Mm. Fabulous, Julie, thank you so much for that succinct uh, summary and such a, such a powerful, important idea. Just slow your brain down, process more through your hand, through your brain, yeah, that's, that's uh, fascinating. Okay, who, who's next? We have no brave souls at the moment. No brave souls. Should we cold call somebody? <laughs> I've got a lot to say. <laughs> um, I would jump in um, with just, I felt like the, um, what did you learn in school today was the article that we focused on, that I focused on. Um, and to me, it just reminded me that kind of that lesson closure is really kind of the money shot for the whole lesson mm -hmm. that being able to tie those things together for the students, the whole, the ideas, the concepts, the information and have them um, process that in some way and refresh it. Um, the way that she did it was in a second grade classroom and they did a weekly summary newsletter to parents and she had a really clear structure and system. So it didn't take all day, it was like 45 minutes and the students designed this newsletter, but it was just this constant practice of 
and continuing to reinforce less enclosure. I mean, I think exit tickets have kind of become popular, but then in some case, I feel like they're overused um, or they're not used appropriately. So just, just coming back to like, you did this great lesson, you taught this great lesson, the kids have experience. If we don't tie it together and really help them synthesize their thinking and do some kind of less enclosure continually, um, they're gonna lose it with what they learned. So thanks for the opportunity. Such a powerful idea. Thank you so much, Tara. Uh, one thing that I add, oh, and, and by the way, overconfidence uh, is very much an issue here. We think we've got it. As the lesson closes, I've got that. And then it just evaporates. Uh, one thing that I advocate with, uh, with conferences with teachers after classroom observations is at the end of the conference to just, and I'm talking about brief visits here and focusing on one thing, just saying to the teacher, what's your big takeaway? And that, again, that sort of reprise, that thinking over that articulating what was that one thing that was most important that we talked about, it just refreshes it and reinforces it in, in everybody's mind. It's such, such an important concept. Thank you so much. Who else, who else has, a, has a wonderfully succinct and, uh, and important uh, insight to share with us? Joanne, if you want to share. Did you say Joanne? Yeah. Uh, I did um, the one on assessment, I think it was five. And it was interesting to me because I've been sort of preaching of this as part of differentiation in the work of Carol Tomlinson. And what, the, what it says is that doing a pretest or even a chap, a beginning of the unit test is a strong strategy uh, to get students, even if they don't do well, which they probably won't, to sort of focus on what is important and what's coming. The only, they also mentioned that this is particularly effective with history, social science, and uh, language and English, not so much in some other areas. Uh, hmm. The only concern I had about it was um, if the test or assessment is very narrow. It might focus the students on only paying attention to certain things. And the other thing though, that I think it's very good for and the why I used it with this school is because they have a lot of high achievers who get very bored. And mm -hmm. by doing this testing ahead of time, the teacher is able to differentiate for them and mm -hmm. not have them sit through what they really already knew. So it's an interesting concept. I, I, we've been trying to use it at this school and it's very difficult for teachers to do this and give a pre-assessment of any kind because then, well, what do I do now? And I said, well, you won't have all those kids acting out who already know what you're saying. So we're mm. working on it. Mm. Francesca, thank you so much. And I'm looking at my watch here, my goodness, uh, it, it is time for Jen to, uh, to talk about the PD summaries that she has so brilliantly written at the end of each, uh, each chapter. So thank all of you, stick with us because Jen is, is gonna wrap up here with, uh, with a summary of what, what exists at the end of, of every one of our chapters. Well, first of all, you notice we didn't do a webinar because we sort of, in the spirit of the chapter, we didn't want to talk at you and have you sit here for an hour. We wanted you to think and do some of the work and build those neural networks. So we look forward to some feedback and hearing how you felt about that. But I want to take a few minutes to talk about, okay, there's lots of great ideas. How could you introduce these ideas to the teachers or the staff members or leaders at your school? So every chapter in the book ends with... Um, a section on PD ideas. So basically I'm here to save you thousands of dollars. Instead of paying a consultant $10,000 to come in and do a workshop on um, what makes learning stick, you can do it yourself. So um, I'll share in the back of this chapter, it's on page 228 if you wanna see what I'm talking about. Um, but there's three sections here with ideas for what you can do with your teachers. The first section is introducing the science of learning to your teachers. So doing a simple jigsaw activity like we did where you have different teachers read different articles and then share them, summaries and what um, the implications are. And then there's a cool activity where you give your teachers a, a pretest. Don't worry, it doesn't count for anything, but you, um, you share some of the more scientific terms from the chapter and you tell them nobody's looking at it, it's just for you. So terms like retrieval and fluency illusion, working memory, and you see if they can define them. And then you say, just hold on to that, okay? 
And we're going to come back to that later. And basically, you're going to be modeling what Benedict Carey calls, um, you know, the pretest effect, which some of you spoke about, um, which is that if you're exposed to the material earlier on, you do better later when they read the chat, the articles. So the second section is when they get to um, your teachers can experience some of this science of learning as if they were the students themselves. And that's often a way I like to do PD is, you know, for them to really buy into it. What does it feel like as if you were the student? So after they've read some more articles, you give them that pretest again and you see, did they do better the second time than the first time as a way to experience that? Um, I also, in the PD section, I have a link to an article on uh, puffins, you know, the uh, penguin-like birds. I just picked some kind of neutral topic. And um, what you do is you ask your teachers to read the first half of the article on puffins without stopping, and then put it down and write down everything they remember. Then they read the second half of the article, but they pause pause, you know, after each paragraph and they and they jot notes, they think about it. And you ask the teachers to see which part of the article they remember better, the first part or the second part. And that's a way for them to practice and see that this whole pausing and thinking about what you learn is a way to encode that learning. So the teachers actually do that as if they were the students. And then the third part of the PD is about um, study skills and memorization. And you have the teachers discuss whether they even think it's their role to teach study skills. I'm a former middle school teacher. I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, but they read some articles. And then at the end of the whole PD time, they are going to consolidate their learning. And they're going to use that Kathy Gansky article that, uh, that Kim highlighted earlier about what did you learn today? Where at the end of the whole PD section, you ask them on an index card or in this virtual world, anywhere in the chat, um, to share what do they take away from today as a way to let the learning sort of set in. Uh, people in my mastermind groups know we always do that at the end as well. So Kim and I are going to do this right now to consolidate your learning from today as a way to close out. And if you can just think about what you read, what Kim and I shared, what you discussed in your breakout groups, if you could um, share what's a takeaway from today. It's, uh, it's not exactly John Dewey quote, but he says that real learning happens not from doing, but from thinking about doing. So you've been here now for almost an hour, if people in the chat could consolidate their learning. And yes, we appreciate the thank yous, but what's one thing you're gonna take away today when you leave? Um, David asks, what strategy structure do I use to summarize a book? Oh, that's a complicated conversation. Happy to email with you about that. It's not easy. Summarization is, is harder than it seems. So handwriting, as well as pausing, great. Someone is going to do this at their December staff meeting. Yes, feel free to email if you've got any questions. Great. Somebody says, wow, 60 minutes of Zoom can be a great PD session. We hope so. We tried to make it interactive. Someone's going to, yes, beg, borrow, take the structure of this PD. I can send you the outline Kim and I used if you want. Take the same thing. Um, Great. Yes, encouraging teachers to intentionally think about how students learn. I know we think a lot more as educators about what we're putting into students' minds than what we're taking out through retrieval. Great. A lot of people, uh, whew, now it's getting fast. Emotional attachment is key to learning. Absolutely. If the students care, they're going to remember more. Pause, think, and code. People like the jigsaw idea, people reading different articles. Fantastic. Great. Um, learning requires activity on the part of the learner. Yeah, I mean, particularly now, for those of you who have students who are learning by Zoom, Zoom fatigue is real and kids are really sitting there. And just because you're behind a computer screen doesn't mean you can, you have to do nothing, right? We asked all of you in breakout groups to do some work. We can be asking our kids to actively learn, absolutely. Another takeaway from Cami Lewis, study over cramming. Absolutely, teach your kids those study skills. Study a little bit each day. Let them forget a little bit, and then it encodes in their brain a little bit more. All right, so yes, Kim wants me not to go over. Um, we thank you for taking your time, taking an hour with us. We really appreciate it. We're going to send in a follow-up email for any uh, feedback from you and to send a, a link to this um, recording. And if anyone wants to unmute themselves and say goodbye, it's really nice to um, hear voices. Kim, anything else to close out? 
just uh, the fact that you have this chapter in electronic form is something we are thinking about is how can we make the chapters it just it, it, something you can grab as a PDF and share out. And so uh, uh, let us know how you feel about that. Uh, but it's great to see all of you. Thank you for being there on a very busy day. We wish you well, we wish you well, that you are well and continue to be well and that we make it through this very, very difficult year with the best ideas uh, for the kids. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Unmute. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great learning. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Hi, Lisa. I didn't see you there, Lisa. Hi. Hi. Good to see you all. Thank you so much. Hi, Kelly. I didn't see your message. I'll look later. Good to see everybody.